Thank you very much. What's up, Open Slava? My name is Jesse Warden. I am effectively a front-end developer, and I've done enough APIs to, I still have a lot to learn, but I can create my own APIs for my UIs. That's kind of where the perspective I'm coming from. So this is an informative talk, if uh, my laptop will stay on. And what we're gonna cover is kind of like a, a lot of topics, a lot of information. So we're just gonna skim kind of the top. So at the very end of the slide deck, which is on my Twitter, on my LinkedIn, it has a bunch of the references of, you know, the more deeper insights to the topics on the left. And then on the right side is citations of all the videos and all the blog posts that I'm referencing here. So there's a lot of information, but I promise that by the end of it, one of these ideas, one of these technologies will help you in some way get uh, just more reliable web applications, mainly from a UI perspective, but maybe an API too. So the concept of, of Regal really has two things. It's a set of philosophies that I've stolen from a lot of thought leaders and people that I've just looked up to in my career, um, from Accenture, from Capital One, from small companies, big companies, consulting, et cetera. And then there's the tech stack that I currently like, but some of the pieces can be interchanged. So I just basically took off the shelf software from AWS and open source, put them together. And so we'll talk about that. And then there's a small part about what could possibly change in the future, just some things coming down the pipe. So the philosophies for me in doing software development is anything that's fast for us, that's for the developers. I don't mean like Go or Rust, like runtime fast. I mean stuff that we can quickly see results, quickly see you know, things that happen. Correctness means that when I write the code, I know it works as best as we can define it. Types functional programming, so not imperative, not oop, but specifically types with functional programming, and then a serverless first mentality around infrastructure, around what you're building, and then just the true Dave Farley definition of CICD or continuous integration and continuous delivery. So when we talk about fast iteration around the philosophy of that, it, the, the problem we're trying to solve is low effectiveness developers. Basically, I'm, the build takes too long or it takes too long to compile. I can't even remember what I was doing. And the, the concept around fast iteration comes from the article that Tim Cochran, he, he takes an engineering manager approach, looking at a tech organization and saying, what happens when we implement new practices, new technology? Is it getting better? Is it getting worse? How do we measure that? And so he has these lists of feedback loops that you can use to determine if your developer organization is fast or whatever. I ignored all of it. My favorite one was basically the, the one where you know if your code works fast. So an example would be, um, doing, you come in the beginning of the day, you immediately have prod alerts. You have no idea if you should be paying attention to it. it you know, your Slack has like, or team, Microsoft Teams has a bunch of notifications. You're not aware. You have to swim in Elasticsearch or Splunk looking at logs to know, should I care about this alert? Or is it the same one that's happened for the past two months? Things like that. You basically leave the day where you don't achieve much. You leave very frustrated and unmotivated. And this kind of leads to what he calls learned helplessness. And like, I've worked for places like that and it's awful. The reverse is high effectiveness where you come in, you know what you're doing very clearly. There's either Trello or Jira is actually up to date and curated. Your pipeline is always green. And if it's not, your team cares about fixing it. So it's a very constant thing instead of being broken all the time. And you can make quick code changes. You can find API docs, all that stuff. Basically, you can come in for the day, feel like you made progress and leave happy that you actually accomplished something. So that, that's kind of what, what the high effect in this bar would be. And again, he has metrics for all this, but the only one I really cared about was the top one about validating a local code change. Now, obviously the tools differ, but low effectiveness would be something that takes forever to um, actually change. And then high effectiveness would be like within five to 15 seconds, I know if it works. So that could be unit test compiling, doesn't matter, is that I write some code and very quickly I know if it works or not and I can keep going, right? So that's, that's my favorite feedback loop. So whatever it is, it should make you fast for the developer. That's, that's kind of the philosophy you're going off. The second is correctness. Do we write code and we know it works? So it's one thing to like quickly iterate like dynamic languages, but it'd be helpful if there's tools in place to help you know, expedite that process. So when I'm talking about correctness, I mean things like syntax, null pointers, and logic, okay? So syntax would be like, from a JavaScript perspective, I write it, but I'm missing a parenthesis. So it's the wrong syntax. Like what I wrote is wrong and the, either the IDE or the compiler can tell me where I messed up. Correct syntax or wrong intent would be, I'm trying to do an equality check, but I accidentally did a set. So those kind of things are where linter and compilers come in. You had a bunch of rules, they find these things and help you out. 
Um, the last one is good syntax, and it's correct, but it was really just because somebody wanted to use map instead of for each to log something out. So, you know, linters and compilers can help here, but the language has to have some kind of information embedded in it with types to help these linters understand how to help you. And so JavaScript is really hard at doing that. So Jerome Ingalls had a presentation where he talked about the doing that from the JavaScript days and moving to Elm and strictly you know, functional programming, where it has that information, it has those guarantees, it has those types. And suddenly, like I think I'm, I'm gonna misquote him, but I think it was like 80% of the rules in ES Lint aren't even needed in Elm because it gets it makes all those situations impossible. You can't mess it up. So now you can start focusing on not only making your code more readable, but you can do optimizations because they can intelligently understand those things. So he's got a really good video, talks about it. I stole this from his Prezo. I really like this because he can understand if that function on the left is doing like a very expensive, you know, pathfinding algorithm that he can recognize from the structure of your code without running it that you're, you're doing a very expensive path every single time. And so you can optimize it just for an if-step. So like little things like this go a long way instead of focusing on like, did you accidentally not use equals, equals, equals versus equals, equals. Like stuff like that is just obnoxious. Um, and then you can take it even far. He has a quote in his video where he says, somebody checked in a PR that removed 5% of their own code base. And he was excited that they didn't have to maintain that code. It reduced their code base. It removed packages. And he said, which is the best, if somebody did that with JavaScript and has a PR, like, I removed 5% of the code base, you're like, you did what now? So, like, that, that level of trust and that lack of anxiety is just very, very empowering. Another example is the null pointer thing that was back in the 60s. So, Tony Hoare, he's like a, a knight or something. He was trying to, an algol, develop the first record or object that allows you to define like and. So you have first name, last name, and age, and a single data type. And so he's like, okay, well, if this object represents something else, but it's not memory, what do I do? So he just made up null. And Mark Rindle has a wonderful presentation talking about all the failures in programming, like the worst ones that don't result in you know, horrible accidents. And Algo W, his explanation was awesome because this just kind of spread into everyone using no pointers and every language kind of making it your problem. So what I like to call it is dots are dangerous. So if you're in JavaScript, Lua, Python, if you use a dot, you have no idea if it'll work. The function couldn't be in the module, the module could be undefined, the object could be there, but it doesn't actually have that property, the person could misspell it, the DOM node may be there, maybe not, an array could be existing, but doesn't have anything in position zero, or it does, but it's not what you think it is. So like, they're just very dangerous. And so a lot of JavaScript developers and Python developers and Lua developers and anybody in a language that has the ability to provide libraries use things like um, undefined. So Python is a perfect example where if you try to access a list item, it'll throw an exception immediately and go, hold on, everything's gonna break. But JavaScript's not, you know, very cool. It's like, nah, man, it's cool, undefined. You keep going. The problem is, it gets in your code and you're like, okay, where in this awesome mess did it actually cause? So null pointers are total pain. So they tried to use things like functional programmers do, like lenses, and they would deeply, safely navigate really big JSON structures. And if it didn't go there, they would have a default. Well, why didn't it find it? <laughs> All you're doing is like papering over the null pointer. Um, and then folktales like, well, Haskell people use maybe, so maybe we could do that too. And it's cool, but then now all the work's on you as a developer, and there's certain cases where you can't guarantee it'll actually work. And then JavaScript's like, all right, we'll copy you know, Kotlin and all these other languages that people got tired of doing null checks, and so they added optional chain. Cool, but why is it null? Like, why is it there? Um, so logic error is the worst, where it compiles, but it doesn't work. And the reason is like, I clicked the button, well, I didn't code the click handler yet. So it compiles, but it doesn't work. Illegal states are, you don't have an error boundary in your React application, and it goes there, race conditions. Uh, now that we do way more distributed architectures with like micro, uh, microsites, where you have like, you know, React and Angular on the same page, different teams. You, you have no contract testing, so you don't know if your schemas are right. Um, they now want you to use formal methods to test your front end. So now you have to learn TLA plus or Alloy to do a distributed architecture on the front end. Um, and Hello Wayne, he wrote a really good tutorial on doing that. But these kind of things are what we're really interested in. These are the hard problems to solve in, in programming. The other ones like syntax and you know null pointers, they've been solved. So let's focus on the hard ones, logic. 
Um, basically, if there's a way to do better syntax, no runtime exceptions, no null programming, we solve those problems. Let's move on and focus on the hard problems, right? Uh, strictly type functional is just, you know, I've just watched a lot of people and it seems to solve problems and it seemed to make sense. I spent like 12 years in OOP. I watched, you know, Martin Fowler and the solid guy and all these people. And I still felt after 12 years, like, I don't know if I'm in the right place, like massive anxiety. I even quit smoking, but it didn't matter. So functional programming, it's really simple. And by the way, if you don't know why it's the norm, if it's so good, the TLDR, if you don't want to watch the whole video, is $500 million marketing budget from Sun Microsystems and a magazine article that had an influential small talk, which has, if you know small talk, it's the real oop. Um, but basically, it's around pure functions, the concept that you have a function that has an input and an output, and there's no side effects. So it's, it's cool because there's only two rules, and no one can disagree, and everyone agrees on them which is fantastic. And they have all these wonderful benefits. The only one I think that matters for this talk is that last one, where if you're trying to learn test-driven development, which if you look at like the DevOps report, it shows that it's really helpful in programming, it doesn't require stubs or fixtures. And all the TDD people talk about is test doubles and you know the pros and cons and stuff like that. So when I talk about test doubles, I mean basically the on the Wikipedia to Gerard Mezzaros, his definition of test doubles, so spies, mocks, all that stuff, right? All you need in functional programming is stubs and fixtures. So all this nonsense of like mocks are dangerous, don't take it too far. Like, what if we don't have that problem? Like you're done, right? It's amazing. <laughs> Sorry, I love the photos. So if you don't understand that the approach to like the, the unit test, everything, you know, is a, a unit under test is like a class, for example. And then the reverse of I'm testing a system and I'm driving the crimes down. Dave probably has a good video talking about the two styles of Chicago and London. Once you watch that video, you understand the approaches to developing software, and then you realize like 80% of their mocks problem aren't ours. So it's a really wonderful thing. So when we talk about no side effects, it took me, I guess, maybe because I'm slow, it took me two years to realize how amazing that is. Where if you don't have side effects, then everything is a pure function, and suddenly every test that you write from a unit test perspective you know, requires maybe some data, a little bit of a stub, and that's it. So you know, the testing becomes easier. So anybody who's tried to do functional programming in a language like Rescript, JavaScript, Python, it has, you know, you can do functional programming, but you, you have to deal with those dependencies. You have to do stuff like that where you stub it in the unit and then you use like maybe a concrete implementation or mock in the, you know, the integration test. And it's just, it's, it's a start, but it's not great. Um, but if you can go to pure functions, then suddenly all your tests are a lot simpler. You don't have to use stubs. You can do, you know, data. So it's a really nice, nice place to be from an Elm and JavaScript perspective. Elm has no side effects, so every test looks like this. Some tests are so stupid because the compiler is amazing. You're like, maybe I should focus on logic tests, right? The really hard stuff. So it's just, it, it's totally freeing. It makes testing a lot more fun, a lot easier to learn if you've never done it. Um, when we talk about strict and sound types, I know some of the people who went to TypeScript are like, yay. The other people who went to TypeScript are like, dude, never again. So I understand types have a cost. There's a burden. The example of types being a cost, mental cost, is that this gentleman or whoever was trying to convince Don Simon, the creator of F Sharp, to implement higher kind of types. So if you don't know what higher kind of types are, this, the TLDR is instead of writing a ray.map or list.map or sequence.map or string.map, you just go, map because you're a Haskell person, you know category theory. And the problem was he's like, you know, there's a cost to that. So this is a guy, Don Syme, who built a language very similar to C sharp, but you don't see the types. It's based on a camel where you write a function, but the compiler is so smart it knows the types. Very rarely do you have to do it. And so even with a language that's typed but you don't see it, he's still super nervous about putting that burden on developers. So I acknowledge that it's you know it's a mental cost. So it has to be worth it if you're willing to do that, right? So reducing impossible states is what, you know, a lot of the, the uh, functional programmers and type people talk about from a modeling perspective. Richard Feldman talks about that if you've never built types first before you build your UI or your API on how to prevent those situations, he's got a really good vi video that actually gives examples. It's not a bunch of talk, it's like real code you can play with. But an example I run into all the time is UI developers like Redux or whatever your state is, context, it doesn't matter. You have some kind of loading screen with the state. You have some kind of, like, I've loaded the data, I'm showing the screen with you know, stuff in it. And then I have you know, some error screen. This thing is not, cannot keep up with Jesse. So that concept of error screen, you have you know, the normal reducer and you only care about it. The problem with that is that when you, when you go to an error, 
and then you retry, you get in this impossible state where you say, all right, I'm not loading and I've got data and I'm in an error. And you're like, dude, really? And like, how did I get here? And so the problem with that is then your UI says, all right, well, we're just going to show, you know, the error screen. It's like, no, it was a successfully loaded data from the server. Why are you showing this? And so that kind of stuff drives me crazy. It's better to use what's called like a, a discriminated union or a product type where you can only be loading or error or success. You can't be both at the same time, like this weird, impossible thing that JavaScript allows. And so whether you're using JavaScript or Elm, it's like a, it's a wonderful you know, type to do. And then when you're an object oriented programmer, you're taught that if I want to build a program, I start with a little bit of inheritance and then I do composition, right? And move classes and functional programming. We just have functions. So the way we put them together is usually through some kind of pipeline or rail, railway programming. So this is actually coming in JavaScript in like, I don't know, five years. But, but it's, it's stage two. So you can play with the Babel uh, plugin for it. It's pretty good. And you can play with these pipes. So I, I talk about that. But functional programmers have been doing this in JavaScript forever using promises, which is really nice because it doesn't matter if it's synchronous, asynchronous. You can use RxJS. It's great. And we don't have to define errors in one place if we want to. The pipeline allows you to do the same thing, but you can do it with async code too, and everything is an expression, right? So we're using the hack style of the pipeline proposal. And it's just nice because you can compose all these pure functions together. And so you, if you have a function that always works and you put it with a bunch of other functions that always work, then your app always works. And if it doesn't, you blame the server side people. They run all this K8 microservice stuff. So I love doing that. Um, but this goes further than code. It, it goes to your, your thinking around architecture. So when you think of lambdas, you think of functions with inputs and outputs. And in almost every single one of these AWS architecture diagrams, they're really showing the side effects, right? And so if you want a lambda to do something, it has some kind of JSON and it spits some JSON out, or true, like I worked and didn't. And if it's more complicated, then you can orchestrate that with step functions, right? So that, that thinking goes to your architecture. So even if a step function has a bunch of things, it has parallel things going at the same time, what comes out is, you know, some input. And so it makes it really, you know, easy from a, I'm going to test it with an input and expect this output and then run it. That kind of mentality, you know, works for your entire architecture. And if you don't know, I got a video of what step functions are. I talked about that in 2022, or 20. Pattern matching first came to Python. And pattern matching usually is a functional type thing. But it got really popular in dynamic languages like Python and JavaScript because sometimes we like the dynamicism of an object. We just only need a piece of that data, like maybe these two fields and the rest of it other people need. And so the closure people like that too. And so Python embraced that fact where you can assert safely on the shape of data. Think about like a switch statement, but instead of doing predicates, you do assertions in a safe way. And so does the data match? So. Richard Hickey, he has a really good explanation around how they use spec to do that. So although closure is very similar to JavaScript from functional, they don't have types. And he's very, very like types cost too much. So I, he's, he's a smart dude, good uh, alternative. Um, but if you're doing that in JavaScript, right, you're, you're, if you have this concept of I have these three types and it can only be, you know, some kind of whatever, you can then convert a lot of what you used to do from a case statement to a pattern matching, which is a lot safer and it you know, does destruction and stuff. So this is at stage one. So I think it'll take a long time, maybe you know, seven years, but you can still play with it too. It, they've got a Babel compiler, it's pretty, pretty legit. And so using this in a Lambda perspective and a front-end perspective, your Lambda's doing all the work. All you care about is at the end, what comes out. You match on success, failure, or success, failure, or retry, whatever those three you know, narrowed things that you can do. So these are three examples in the three languages these write Lambda's in. That also goes back to your architecture. Does my Lambda, when it's done and it worked, what do I do? Cool. You put the data in DynamoDB, I'm processing you know, a bunch of events. If it doesn't work, I let SNS know and it goes to my alerting system. So that pattern matching concept, you do in your architecture as well. If you're trying to do like a bunch of things at once, and if it fails, you have to clean up your mess. Yan C has a great example of using the Sagar pattern and step functions. If I book a hotel, book a flight, and rental blows up, then I've got to unbook the flight, unbook the hotel. And so you pattern match on each one of those. And if it doesn't work, you can look and see where it failed. So like step functions are really great with that from that pattern matching in a way that you can audit it versus like my code broke, I look in logs, I don't know what's going on. Um, so what we're trying to do is model away impossible states, increase the reliability of code and basically make your linting help you, right? Serverless first, pretty simple. It's just 
<laughs> we think everything should be serverless, and the Kubernetes people have to tell us why not. That's kind of the attitude. Um, so when I say serverless, I mean that stuff. I don't mean that stuff. So my ex-boss used to say, Fargate, serverless. I'm like, all right, we can be friends, but like, no, it's not. Um, so when you're thinking of like, I'm building things, right? You say, I want an API. Cool, API gateway, lambda function, right? Really simple start. And then maybe it has a data source, maybe it has a caching layer like Redis, doesn't matter, but you start simple and go from there. AWS provides so many primitives for you to build your own stuff, even as a front end developer. And then the security people are like, you can't use API Gateway, but you can use AOBs because they have more you know, VPC network control, fine. Same thing, it's a URL, goes in your Lambda and you respond for the web, right? Really simple. And then you're like, well, wait a minute, now my database is getting hammered because I don't handle that pressure. Cool, you put SQS in front of it with a FIFO queue and you just adjust knobs, right? So when they say, are you full stack? I'm like, yeah, I adjust knobs and flip switches. So maybe it's in YAML instead of Terraform, it's the same concept. Um, if you need to do something complicated, you step functions. And from an app scene perspective, um, serverless is very similar to violence. If it's not working, you just need to use more of it. So in app sync's case, if you're trying, somebody laughed, all right, good. It, I didn't know if that joke would go over well. So the app sync perspective from Lambda, if like, I wanna know out of these three Lambdas that support all these queries, if they broke, well, they all, when you ever do a console.log or print, it all goes to CloudWatch. In CloudWatch, you can set up an error rule. Anytime the word error appears in the logs, it triggers another Lambda. And this whole Lambda parses the error, looks at it and says, should I care about this at three in the morning when I get a text from my phone on PagerDuty, yes or no? And that's what you use to forward along the SNS, which then goes to something like PagerDuty or XMAT, whatever you're using for monitoring and on call, right? So that kind of stuff is not just for APIs, it's for helping you as the front end developer, you know, manage your stuff. And I, I talk a big game about serverless, but I'm fine being, I know there's nuance and there's places. So like when I was at a bank, we had a mainframe hybrid architecture where the mainframe would like take bank statements and put them on S3 bucket. We shared the bucket with like, I think six teams. So we ran out of, you only have five Lambda triggers on it. So then we used event bridge instead, which does the same thing. And then that would trigger a step function, which would launch batch. So batch, because these mainframe, anybody ever coded or parse Ipsitic? I don't know if I'm saying that right. It's basically a mainframe file from like the 1960s and it's never changed. So you have to parse it with Go in a single threaded environment. So we spin up these massive EC2s and batch is like, uh, like an ECS cluster, but it comes up and then shuts down. And so you use step function to launch it, make sure it doesn't take too long and then try again, right? Or alert us if it went bad. So it's great. We got a single database that they can see their banking statements every morning at 10 o'clock. Another team would then use the serverless Dynamo stream to attach to that and then do their own step function and go to their database for their API. So there's a lot of mix here. There's serverless, there's servers, right? And the good news is, as soon as I see Docker, I'm like, yeah, the interns totally got the Docker Go part. That's great. I don't want to code that stuff. So the point is we make AWS handle most of the reliability uptime. We focus on code. Trunk-based CSD. There's too much to say, so I'll just basically say all we care about is I follow Dave Farley's church of CSD, where we don't use feature branches, we don't use Git flow, right? We're, we're on the same team, whether we're in the same country or not. And we all check in the main or master or whatever you call it, and there is no branches or anything. Everyone go, go, go. And we all, our top priority beyond delivering value is to make sure the pipeline is green. That's it, that's all it is. So as long as you focus on trunk, you commit often, you fix the build if it's broken, and make sure the pipeline's at least five to 10 minutes, totally legit, right? The challenge with that is if everything's like ready to go to prod all the time, every 15 minutes, planning that work is really hard as a tech lead. I'm not a tech lead, but I'm trying to learn, and planning sometimes a front-end change with a back-end change is very difficult. So Valentina wrote a wonderful article that talks about how do you schedule work for that, knowing that it's gonna be, you know, maybe behind a feature flag or not. Very, very interesting stuff. Okay, so that's the philosophy. That's where I'm coming from. These are the people I stole ideas from. Here's the tech stack. GraphQL is basically a domain language for UI people. They, they talk about APIs and stuff, but it's really for us, right? So if you've never done domain-driven design, the problem is the book is this thick, and the only part that's good is the second half where he talks about domain, like designing. He doesn't really talk about object-oriented stuff. And so Scott Waleskin, he talks about it from a functional perspective. We use ands and ors to model your domain and real you know, business objects, what your business or product owners are saying. It's, it's amazing. 
And so we can use that domain language. So like, for example, if you're trying to get a lease or a loan, borrow money in the United States, we can say, all right, what's the minimum and maximum I can do for this store or this e-commerce store? It can only be one type of these loans. It's either deferred interest or reduced rate, not both. And of those merchants, they might have the same arrays on the, the property, but they're either a lease, a loan, or both, full spectrum. So you know the difference. And the, the great thing about queries is that the same thing we use in functional programming. They're functions with inputs and outputs, right? Like it's, it's, it's amazing from a test perspective. The only challenge I've found is I don't know any way to denote what's idempotent or not. So that's, the, that's the challenge because sometimes it's out of your control. So you do your best you can. The nice thing is that as a UI developer, the types look the same when I go from front to back. So you're context switching like, I'm a UI developer, I'm an API developer. And like you have to context switch in different code and it's hard. But having the types look the same, at least you know what a minimum maximum is. It's the same between layers. Really, really helpful. Also, it denotes if it's null or not. And because it's null, it's actually a maybe, so it doesn't explode, which is kind of nice. Um, AppSync. So AppSync is a way to do manage GraphQL. So instead of spinning up an Apollo server, put it in Docker, waiting 20 years, throwing it in Kubernetes, and then hoping it doesn't crash. Instead, you can just put your schema up in AppSync, and you're good to go. It optionally comes with a Route 53, so if you want a real URL, and it handles caching, caching, and validation. The nice thing is that every single query and or field goes to a Lambda of your choice. It could be one, if you're doing a Lambda lift, it could be many, and that goes to some other service. Every request, you get to choose how you want to authenticate. So I, I like the JSON web token just because most of the websites that I integrate with are being, you know, like JSON and stuff. But every request is validated, and it can go from like, uh, we, I put Secrets Manager there because that's where your, your secret keys are to validate stuff. Now, those Lambdas can still be in other VPCs if they're only allowed permission-wise to like access you know, a particular cluster, for example. So they can be anywhere. They can be you know, configured. The AppSync controls you know, who they go, go to. And you can embed logic on the authorizer if they're really allowed to do that query. So you got a lot of control there. Kind of nice. Um, and if you don't have your Lambdas filled to the GraphQL, you just get all the data, AppSync will handle filtering for you, which is super dope. Um, and then, yeah, you can do cache and validation too. So Amplify, Amplify, I found out by accident. Somebody said, how do you host a website on AWS? I'm like, I don't know, man. I always give it to the ops people. I don't know ops. And then I found this Amplify thing. I'm like, dude, this is dope. And so everyone's like, does it use S3? I'm like, yeah. Does it use CloudFront? Yeah. And like, blah, blah, blah. They're like, why don't you put all of that in Terraform? I'm like, what if I don't? Like, it's this much serverless. So it's the same thing, but it's really simple to use. And the great thing is that you just link it to your GitHub repo, and every time you check in, it just makes a build and validates the cache, and you usually can see the site. You don't have to say, can you please clear your cache? Like, those problems go away. So it's absolutely amazing. And it has, you know, built-in code deploy. You don't have to know what code deploy is. It just builds your stuff and tests your stuff. It has a Cypress container. They maintain updating the security. They maintain rebuilding the Docker container with Cypress. It's amazing. So... That's great to start, but once you start doing real CSD, you want to test your deployment before, you want to test after you've deployed, you want to do some kind of green-blue, they don't support that yet. So the easiest way I found is instead of having like a five-minute rollback where you fail forward, you can instead, uh, before you commit, you commit to an old branch, and you can very quickly run that AWS command to switch it back. So it's just a quick way to do you know, quick, like five seconds to change rather than five minutes, which is kind of nice. So Lambda is cool from a serverless perspective. The challenge is that as a functional developer, they still use the old school exception thing, right? So if things work, you return a value or you don't do anything if you're Go, right? Otherwise, you throw an exception. And that's very important because that exception is how they handle retry. So SQS, if it has a problem, it'll retry. Step functions, they have the option of retrying. Uh, step, you know, the, the APIs interpret that as a 500. So there's a lot of reasons you want to follow that contract. So how do you architect these lambdas to, as a functional developer, go, you know, with that way? And the best way I've seen is... Uh, the, the guy who used to make made fun of the JavaScript videos, he, he has a really cool philosophy called functional core imperative shell. So like 99% of your code is 100% pure functions, easy to test, domain logic. And then you do little stuff to put, you know, the imperative stuff to get it going, right? So what that looks like in practice, oh no, this slide sucks. What it looks like in practice is you have a basic Lambda, right? But all your pure code 
is expects everything to work. So that's the stuff on the bottom. And notice I, I've injected like a PG module. I'm actually doing a query there. The, the better way is to just do like the go style where you basically inject the response. So assuming I have all my data, I just test it, I parse it, I'm good to go. And then you do all the imperative stuff actually in the Lambda. So that way, when you're done, you go either give the data or throw. So 90% of your code is testable, you feel good about, and you have a little shell up top to do that. If you want to do it the promise way, that's cool too. It's insane. It doesn't really matter. Now, so Rescript was because um, I wanted a, a language that was faster in TypeScript and didn't have oop baggage and didn't have 50,000 escape hatches. And I looked all over the place for it. I have some videos if you're interested about why. I have a longer speech. But bottom line is I fell in love with Elm, and then I found out that they don't like it when you use it on server. They will modify their compiler to make sure you don't. So um, I was like, well, what do I do for, like, the server, CLI, library? Like, I want to have the same, you know, wonderful language there. And Rock is getting there. Rock's like Elm, but for everything else, it's not quite done. Probably it's going to be another two years before we can use it. So TypeScript, I, it's just too slow on big projects. Elm is client set only. F Sharp is amazing, but the docs are atrocious. If you're trying to learn, I'm too stupid for Haskell. Computer. I tried. I tried. I gave it three years. I give up. Uh, Rust is amazing, but it's too slow. So like, when I compile, I'm like, what was I doing? I don't really remember. Um, and I, I try Scala, but then like you walk in a room, there's a bunch of Java guys, and you're just like, yeah, I don't really fit in with y'all. So I don't know. Maybe I, maybe maybe I need to meet more Java people. Um, the TLDR is, Rescript is like TypeScript. It's a language. You write it, and it compiles to JavaScript. It's like TypeScript compiles as an association, so you can use it in enterprise. It's you know, very safe. Um, they have a really decent IDE and VS Code. And uh, from a library perspective, you can use everything on NPM, all the types, all that other stuff, which is amazing. You can use you know, Node.js to um, build. Bottom line is, it, I think the most important thing is the compilation is the fastest on the planet. And the reason that's a big deal is you look at all the wonderful open source projects around, like Dino took all the TypeScript out in their internal tooling and used JavaScript. And then there's like one person trying to make a Go compiler that redoes all the TypeScript stuff. And then another one in Rust, it's, it's, it's good, good effort. It's like, I could just use Rescript and not worry about that. Um, it still has escape hatches, it sucks. And the JavaScript inner app is dangerous, but you can use everything in Node. So that's really helpful. You get this, you know, the fast boot up time, it's amazing. The cons for me is it still has side effects like JavaScript, and the compiler errors aren't as nice. It's like somewhere has a problem. It's like, you're a compiler. Tell me where. Uh, and JavaScript is dangerous. And then they have this weird OCaml thing where like, they do data first instead of last. Really, really hard. Um, but pay attention to types. So that's TypeScript, right? You try to add a string and a number. It's like, no, can't do it. Rescript does the same thing, but A, it knows they're uh, integers, and B, if you try to do it with floats, it'd be even more powerful, and it, it takes 10 microseconds to compile instead of one second like TypeScript. So, Rescript's dope. It has, you know, the same types like aliases. It has the maybe, so you can avoid null pointers. It's got all the good stuff you would expect. Um, it's also got pipeline programming built in, right? So you can do the, the standard pipeline programming instead of doing that mess up top. Um, if you want to do promises, because you have asynchronous stuff, you can do you know, the same thing as promise at all. It has the same thing type or TypeScript has for variadic tuples. So if you're putting data in like an array and you want to put it in like some kind of tuple structure, it's typed. So everything's there. And it also supports currying. So if you're into functional currying that confuses people, it's built in. Um, and JSON is, is a pretty cool library where you get uh, deterministic JSON encoding. And if it doesn't work, it tells you where. So if you've got really big JSON structures that you want nice typed and nice compile errors, it'll tell you at runtime. So I use this all the time for lambdas, both inputs and outputs. One minute, really? So from an Allen perspective, um, there's too much to say. So I'm just going to have to blow through this slide. Um, but basically, the elevator pitch is no runtime errors, no, no, no pointers, no undefined as a function ever. The, if you're, you know, no try-catch because there's no exceptions. There's no side effects. So everything's do managed effects. The runtime handles the side effects. You just write code, very pure. You never need a mock for the unit test, which is super balling. You still got to write in the unit test. Um, it's got time traveling debuggers. So every single event you do is very similar to like a Redux action. So you can time travel debug. If you're wondering, um, there's a multiple ways to do fast compiling and bundling. Uh, GraphQL actually does code gen from your GraphQL. So this generates all the code and you just write queries on top of that. Um, when you're with a team of like 30 developers, you can refactor because the compiler will help you. So that they have this term called fearless refactoring. 
Um, and then you learn it once. There's no like, well, it used to be Redux, but now it's context, but now it's use reducer, but now it's NGRX, oh wait, that's Angular. Like you, all that goes away. It's been the same for like 10 years or okay, maybe about six years, but it doesn't change. Okay, I'm negative, thank you. Um, so yeah, not much to tell about Elm. They have functions. You don't have to add the type definitions you don't want to. You just have a function, you define the name, and when you call it, you say function name, there's no parentheses, there's no commas. It's just very simple. And if you want to, they have, uh, you can't do any mutations like you can in JavaScript. So you, every time you call it, you always get the same result, which means that there's a lot of optimizations that can be done. Let's see what else. I'm going to play through these. Same thing, this types, no, nothing special. I think what is special is the compiler errors. These inspired Rust compiler because the compiler errors are so good and so helpful that the Rust people are like, we got to have the same thing. Um, let's see what else. What's interesting? Yeah. So if you're used to like new class, that would be type alias. And if you're used to enum, that would be type the product type on the bottom. So it can only be one or the other. So you can combine these two to make really rich type definitions of whatever your uh, domain is. And they don't have null pointers, these maybes, which there's pro and con. At first it's fun, but then when your code base says maybes, it's a pain in the neck. Um, so yeah, blah, blah, blah. I'll let you look at this later. But yeah, and if you don't include those, the compiler will tell you. This is where you tell your designer, your product owner, like, what do we do when this first name doesn't exist in a database? In a React code base, I'm like, we have to test it to see. Here, you can say, what do I draw? So I've, I've gotten this really good habit of when, when a compiler forces me to write nothing, I render like, the designer doesn't know what to put there and it pisses them off, but you know what they do? They design the screen. So it works out really well. Thanks for that compiler. Um, again, side effects, if you're doing it in JavaScript, you have to like set up some kind of stub. Elm, you don't. So if you're trying to test it, you would have a mock and say, all right, before I do it, call it. And then when I'm done, reset it. Where like, there's no side effect when you call HTTP get, it's just an object. So your test has become super stupid simple, which is fantastic. Uh, overall architecture, basically Amplify is its own repo. And it has some kind of code deploy to keep moving that new check-in of your Git repo in the code deploy. It manages all the Cypress, runs your indent test in Cypress there. The actual GitHub, um, I would recommend you use UI Canary to monitor it, which you can't run the Cypress over time. UI Canaries use something like Puppeteer to do that. The GraphQL queries, when a user makes a query, that GraphQL goes to AppSync, and that's a completely separate repo. It can hit whatever. But again, I recommend also use an API Canary for that to like monitor it you know, as time goes on if you don't check in and stuff. Um, and so together, I, I feel like both repos are good because GraphQL encourages backwards compatibility. So you can independently deploy each kind of like a microservice and it doesn't matter, but you can still choose to like, you know, update one line of code in the Lambda, for example. So again, we use Elm to build web UIs. It's a fast compiler, no runtime exceptions. It's just, it's really nice from a fearless refactoring. GraphQL allows its UI people to design what we need from the back end. All these microservices have a piece of like a user or a loan. I can kind of grab all that stuff together, put it in what I need for my UI, and GraphQL allows me to manage that. Amplify is, I'm an art student and I can host on AWS. Thank you, Amplify. My self-esteem is reassured. Rescript is because Rock isn't ready. That's all I'll say about that. Um, AppSync, it's just so I can have managed GraphQL. I want to do an API layer, it just handles it. It's really easy to set up from a Lambda perspective. Um, and so what's coming in the future, the mono repo, there's a lot of interesting tech around serverless deploy, can you know, implement your functions quickly so you don't have to do a build. AWS SAM Accelerate kind of does the same thing. So it updates your Lambda like in seconds if you want to test stuff. Um, I haven't found a GraphQL generator for Rescript, which would be nice. Uh, definitely check out Rock Lane. It's going to have the same Elm style, no side effects, everything's pure, but it'll work on the server. Um, and so everything I've talked about on, on y'all's left, yeah, is all, all the stuff I've talked about. And on the right is every reference to everything I uh, looked at. So if you've got any other questions about that. Um, yes, we're now one minute left. A question. Is there any? Yeah, it will be quite challenging for you. Let's try one question. Oh, for me? Mm -hmm. Let's go. I give you one minute to answer why React. Why, why React? Why React? Uh, so I'm, I'm recently unemployed and I booked two weeks of interviews. If I had said React is dope, I would have had a job first day. So React is a guaranteed way to find a plethora of job opportunities. I don't enjoy it, but if you want a job, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, time's up. There are some other questions, so yeah.
probably stop Jesse somewhere and you can ask Dirk. Yeah, I can answer that in 10 seconds. Right. Okay. It was fun, y'all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.